Welcome to Brand Nevat. We are delighted to have back one of our most popular guests. We've recorded an episode on anarchism with Mike Kim before, and we're going to be talking about his new book, Justice Before the Law. Mike, would you like to start with a thought experiment? So this is a real case from early America when America was still a British colony. So there's a trial for uh, John Peter Zenger, who was at the time, the publisher of the New York Weekly Journal. So this is a newspaper in colonial America. And basically he had published a series of attacks on the governor of New York, accusing him of being a tyrant. And so the governor to respond to this, had him prosecuted for seditious libel. And okay. So he's on trial and during the trial, his defense is everything I published is true. And then his lawyer offered to prove that it was all true and he was going to prove that the governor really is a tyrant. And the prosecutor argued that was irrelevant. He said that in, in British law at the time, truth was not a defense against the charge of libel. Okay. And the judge agreed with the prosecutor and so instructed the jury to disregard that. And he, the judge disallowed the defense from offering any evidence of the truth of the statements. And then he pretty close to ordered the jury to find the guy guilty. And then, yeah, you know, the jury went away and deliberated and they came back with not guilty. All right. And so there was no, there's no possibility that they didn't think that he did it. So he totally admitted that he published that material. And so they just rejected the law because that's bullshit. And so began the, the, the tradition of jury nullification and also so began our tradition of free speech in America. And the philosophical question about that is what really is the job of the jury? Should they just be following the law and just judging as a matter of fact, whether somebody violated the law or should they be exercising some moral judgments in deciding what is the just outcome of the case? I'm curious whether you see morality and justice as the same thing. The just thing to judge or the just judgment in any given case is the moral judgment. Are those two equivalent or do they come apart? Um, they're not the same thing because justice is like a subset of moral concerns. The way I think of it is justice has to do with respecting people's rights and giving people what they deserve. Like if somebody committed a crime, they deserve some amount of punishment. So justice is getting the proportionate punishment for the crime. But there could be other moral concerns. The reason to give to charity, you have moral reasons to donate to charity, but I wouldn't say there are reasons of justice. So one way in which they might come apart is the view that as long as you know what the rules are in advance and you're punished in terms of those rules, then you have been treated justly. And that might be quite different from plugging in a particular moral principle. So you've relied on something like dessert and a deontologist is going to say that's an important moral principle. Jason's a hard nosed utilitarian. He's going to say dessert has absolutely nothing to do with it. The only question for him in determining whether a law is moral or just is whether it maximizes the good. And so he's going to be happy to punish innocent people, um, disproportionately <laughs> torture people if we can yield the greatest good. There are no limits on Jason's moral compass because he thinks ultimately it's for the best. So that's what justice requires for him. Yeah, I, I would say if this is your view, you should maybe just not use the terminology of justice. That's too far, right? This you have the case where there's a hypothetical case where there's been a crime and the officials can't find the actual criminal and they're afraid there are going to be riots if nobody is punished. So they decide to frame an innocent person and punish that person to stop the riots. Okay. So if that's the right thing to do on utilitarian grounds, it's still not the just thing. So it's just abandoned talking about justice at that point. Yeah, so I think I agree with you that talk about justice on my view would fall away, but I would resist all of these Kant examples, right? So the utilitarian has responses, which will make the utilitarian outcome more palatable in almost all cases. But I agree, it does seem to not be just or justice that we're talking about. It's something else. So one of the things that you alluded to earlier was what a jury ought to do. And so in South Africa, for example, we used to have a jury system, but now we determine things through a judge. And the difference is that a jury votes and we don't know the underlying reasons for their decision. Whereas a judge will explain why they've come to a particular outcome. And so they might see, for example, that there's a disjunct between a particular piece of law and what justice would require. And they have a couple of options available to them. The one is to say, my job as a judge is to apply the law as I find it. 
and that is my obligation. And that is what I'm going to do. The other one is to say, I know what the law is. It is unjust and I'm not applying it. And I'm going to use a separate moral principle. Another one might be to say, the law is immoral. And I'm going to rely on some other principle of law inside of our system. So we have a thing called uh, contra bones mores. In other words, the law is contrary to the public good. Uh, and on that basis, I'm striking the law down and that's why I'm not enforcing it. The other route might be a little bit less honest, which is to say, well, I know that the ordinary meaning of the words would make you think that the law implied this, but actually, if you use this particular interpretive method, you don't have to have that obligation. And so they try and have their cake and eat it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the last one is probably the, the most practical, like the most likely to succeed and not get you reversed. You might worry about deliberately misinterpreting laws. You might worry about the precedent that this sets or something, but actually judges have been doing that so much for so long that there's really, there's no precedent setting going on anymore. And they already said that precedent many times. They'll just, oh, the constitution contains a right to an abortion. It's just like on the face of it, it looks like they're obviously just making up a legal doctrine based on their own moral views, right? Um, yeah. And that strikes me as a problem. So one of the reasons why it might be a problem is that if you think democracy matters and you think that the people have voted for certain people to enact the things that they hold dear to them, judges aren't democratically elected. So when a judge says in my private moral system, I'm going to invent a right. And you know, what you say with regards to abortion, basically what you have is a case where a right to privacy is derived from other rights in the American constitution. And then later that privacy right is used to say someone has a private right of their own body and therefore you ought not to have an abortion. What's interesting about American constitutional law is 200 year old historic document, and you know, a current society. And one of the moves is to basically say, we need to treat this thing as a living document. So we're just going to interpret as we go. Uh, and fidelity to the text is less important. And then of course you're going to have schism. Some people say, hold on a second. So the founding fathers came up with this. If you want to change it, there's a process you have to go through. And if you start willy nilly changing the rules, you're actually doing something quite unjust which is people didn't agree, you know, to be bound by those rules. You had some unelected judge appointed by a particular president who's sitting there for life, deciding what, what the law shall be based on private sense of morality, not something that everyone would agree to. Yeah. So what? So it's not the case that everyone agreed to the laws anyway. So, right. And then you might say, oh, okay. But like, at least they agreed to have the politicians who made the laws. No, because actually most of the people didn't even vote at all. And among the ones who voted, it's usually only like slightly more than 50% who voted for this politician. You can get elected with 25% or because half the people didn't vote then. Okay. But then, and why can't you make the same argument about the judges? So like they didn't vote directly for the laws. They only voted for the politicians. Okay. But also the politicians that they voted for appointed the judges. Why isn't that just as good? Right. So if you think you have to have direct democracy, then, you know, the, the laws as they are right now are illegitimate. If you think it's okay to have representative democracy, why not have this other indirect representation? Which by the way, that's actually like a lot of the laws anyway, because most of the laws are regulations made by bureaucrats who were not elected either, but it's just, they were appointed by the politicians. Okay. But like the underlying philosophical issue is the majority of people don't have the right to just violate the rights of the minority. If there's some action that would normally be considered a rights violation, it doesn't become okay because a majority of people wanted it. So if that's not where rights are coming from, so if the legislature and politicians are not generating real rights, where do they come from? Oh, they don't come from anywhere. There's not like a location where they make rights that they, that they give them to you. What does it mean to have, so what you might be asking is like, why do I think we have the rights that we do? And I need the genesis, right? So they need to be rooted in something I'm assuming, or they're like built into the fabric of moral community. I don't know. Yeah. They're not rooted in anything. I don't know. Like, I don't even understand this idea of moral truth being rooted in something like, okay, you're a utilitarian, right? So you think. Pleasure is good and pain is bad. And what is that rooted in? I can make an intuitive case for that. So I can say to you, you remember that last time you had a hot poker stuck into your side? How did that feel? Awful. That's the kind of thing you want to avoid in life. And how did it feel when you had your last okay. orgasm? That was great. But that seems like a good thing. That seems like a bad thing. With no rights, it's not so clear what the intuitive appeal is that these have fundamental, they just pop into existence. No, but when you say like, how did it feel? That's just saying that hot poker is caused pain, right? Like, how do I know that pain is bad? Apart from knowing that it's painful, right? Or I know that pain is bad. 
then, and then you just say that's obvious on its face. Okay. But like the basis for moral judgments in general is uh, you think about some situation and then it strikes you intuitively as right or wrong or good or bad. And I mean, that's, that's true about all moral systems. It's just that the utilitarians like some intuitions and they don't like others. Okay. But so like, why do I believe that people have the rights that I believe they have basically because there are common judgments that people will, will make about hypothetical cases. Right. So like I described the case where you're framing the innocent person in order to stop the rights and the great majority of people have just have the intuitive reaction. That's not right. And so that could be explained by saying something like you have a right not to be punished unjustly or punished for things that you didn't do or something like that. So if I understand you've written on this notion of moral intuitionism, so you'll say there's generally a consensus around a certain group of rules where everybody says you've got a problem if your moral theory is intruding on these things. And there's going to be certain things at the margin where people are a bit debating it. It's a bit ambiguous. You have a clash of values. Abortion might be one of those things where some people say, we think that this fetus has a right to life and it's wrong to kill. Other people say, we believe the mother has a right to privacy, so it's wrong to tell her what to do with her body. And maybe one of those fundamental moral supremes just can't resolve, or you're going to wind up in some compromise case. Okay. You can start interfering in bodily integrity at this case, but not at this case. But when we're looking at a system of law and I take it. You're going to think there are some laws that it's just to disobey, that the right thing to do is say, I will not enact this law. I will not obey this law. What rubric do you have in mind to work that out? Oh, yeah. So there's no algorithm for answering this, right? The simple answer is, well, laws are violating people's rights. <laughs> Those are wrong. Okay. But it's not really that simple because if there was like a really good reason, if you have to violate some rights in order to stop World War III, then it's right to do it. So I don't know exactly, like, in the, I can't give a complete list of all the things that are just or unjust, but, but in the book, there are plenty of examples of things that I don't think that you need the complete theory of justice to evaluate, right? There are plenty of examples where I think virtually everyone is going to agree, oh, that's unjust. So like you have the story of there's somebody getting a 70 year prison sentence for stealing a tuna fish sandwich from a whole foods market. And then there's another case of somebody getting a 60 year sentence for selling a total of about $40 worth of cocaine to a police informant. And even if you're against drugs, this does not seem like a just sentence. Right? Yeah. So, you know, you don't have a complete answer. You have to exercise intuitive judgments, but there are some cases that are really clear. And so if you find it really clear that something is unjust, then you shouldn't go along with it. So do you think that there really is a threshold? In other words, to say when it becomes apparent that this law is so disproportionate, so unfair, then you have a good reason to depart. But in the sort of lesser case we go, I'm not sure, maybe there's some arguments in favor of this. If we're going to, the tuna fish sandwich guy, I'm going to assume he was a repeat offender. And we say, look, he stole a whole bunch of things. We try to sanction him. It doesn't seem to help. The only way that we can ensure this person doesn't do this is we've got to give him some kind of sanction. So 70 years. Yeah, that's beyond the pale. That sort of causes a sense of shock, but one year in jail. Um, now you've got a question if you sort of said, well, does this guy deserve a year, maybe not just for the sandwich, but for all the other stuff. Maybe this is the kind of person who is a kleptomaniac where you say, look, the only way to prevent this person from stealing is lock them up for good. You've got to call them up from society. Like you could have someone who's a, who's a serial killer or a, an unrepentant child rapist and you go, look. Sorry, we just have to remove you from society forever. It might be disproportionate, but you might think that overall you could tolerate such a rule like that in society. Yeah. With regard to that last point, yeah, that guy was probably going to keep doing it for the rest of his life. Okay. But then you got to weigh that against the unjust punishment. So in that case, in the tuna sandwich case, it seems like it's actually better to have that guy keep stealing, keep committing petty thefts for the rest of his life than be in prison for the rest of his life. But if it's a more serious crime, then yeah, if you, ha if you have a serial killer, basically you have to keep him in prison forever because if he just commits one more crime that outweighs all the harm of keeping him in prison and recidivism is very common, right? Most criminals, after they get out of prison, they're going to commit another crime in the next few years. Oh, but, but and what your question started with was there could be cases where it's up for dispute whether something is just or unjust. And in the course of writing the book and thinking about it, I slightly moderated my position, right? Like the beginning, I was going to say, you should just do whatever is just. And 
if you don't know what's just make your best judgment and then do whatever accords with your best judgment. But then later on, I started to think if it's unclear, there are reasons for going along with the law. So if it's substantially unclear whether the law is just or unjust, then by default, go along with the law. Even if it's reasonable to think that it's just, even if that wouldn't be your guess. And I thought about that partly because you need to have that kind of, you need people to have that kind of disposition in order to have kind of social peace, because there's always going to be these disagreements. So I wonder if there's a problem for your position collapsing back into the system you don't like. Not the legislative system, but at least a common law system. So if I understand common law correctly, it's an iterative process where judgment is passed down over time and those judgments generate precedents which guide future judgments, not necessarily absolutely, but they sway future judgments. And there's more and more judgments in more and more cases and the law evolves out of a series of judgments. I wonder whether someone couldn't argue that it sounds like that's just society's intuition being manifested, right, in the common law. So isn't that just what you want? You want these intuitive rights and intuitive principles to be upheld. And that's what justice is for you. So isn't that just common law? Yeah, the common law is quite good on the whole. Most of the unjust laws are statutory laws, oddly enough, because you, know, you might think, oh yeah, we should be able to incorporate the common moral sense of the community through democracy, but it doesn't really work that way because what people do is just vote to exploit a minority for the sake of their own interests. Now it's, there could be common law doctrines that are seriously, obviously unjust, but I can't really think of any, like all the cases I could think of, obviously unjust laws and unjust punishments and so on are a result of politicians making statutes. So I wonder about cases where there's an ideological difference. So let's say you have a, a, a competition law rule, which says that companies cannot collude over price. So we had a famous case in South Africa where a bunch of bread manufacturers got together and they agreed to sell loaves of bread at a dollar. And the idea was actually to make the price cheaper and it would have had the effect of locking out new bread manufacturers from the market. They were then fined by the competition authorities for colluding in price fixing. Now you can imagine someone saying, what's the problem with price fixing? Either it generated a benefit for the poor that were getting loaves of bread cheaper, or this is just a matter of agreement. Or you can have someone saying, there's a danger in price fixing and we ought not to have these sort of corporations be able to band together. So depending on your political views on that, you might come to a different outcome. And so in other words, imagine when one of those bread manufacturers all before a court, they say, well, I just, I'm a libertarian and I don't believe in any of this competition law stuff. I think it's totally unjust. And so I, I just exercise my personal autonomy alongside, you know, the other corporations and it's wrong for you to punish us. Would that, is that the kind of defense that we ought to celebrate? Yeah. My, my view is the defendant should be able to offer whatever defense they want. I guess there have to be some limits to that. They can't offer defenses that are like, if you vote to convict me, I'll kill you. That's my defense. You shouldn't be able to do that. Okay. But an actual argument that they shouldn't be punished, that somebody could believe, right? That they believe they're not just lying. They should be able to present that and see if that persuades a jury or a judge on uh, now what would, it, what would happen if you give that defense? If you have some libertarians on the jury, then they'll probably vote to acquit. And then the other people will probably vote to convict. Mm -hmm. And then, so you probably get a hung jury or something like that until you, and then they do a retrial oh. and then they do that until they get an agreement, like in, until they get a jury that doesn't have any libertarians on it, or they get a jury full of libertarians and then the guy just gets acquitted. Okay. So then, so a result of this, if a bunch of people buy my book and then they start like taking it to heart, a result will be that uh, some laws are more difficult to enforce and the enforcement will be inconstant. So like sometimes you would get punished for this price fixing thing and sometimes you wouldn't, but uh, that strikes me as not a terrible result. Like. I think maybe that is the right result, right? If you have a law that's controversial in that way, maybe it should not be regularly enforced. And then the officials have some incentive to focus on other crimes that are less controversial or if they want to get convictions. Now I take it, in other words, you have an end state in mind, which would be the best state of affairs would be to remove from our law, all those laws, which are unjust and along this process, 
what you have is a kind of ramshackle approach where some individuals are basically, when they have the power to use it, like the jury member, are going to destabilize the system and it sends it back a kind of market signal saying, look how uneven this is getting, look how arbitrary this is getting, maybe we need to start repealing. And if you think about the approach to decriminalizing drugs in America, it's gone that way. You don't have a blanket change to the law. You have different states, either through democratic processes or through other kinds of litigation saying that there's a social change here. Some people don't think they should be punished for growing marijuana or selling cocaine or whatever it is. And you have this ramshackle thing and there's an arbitrariness. It could be that you're doing something that's perfectly legal in Colorado and you, you know, go a couple of hundred miles across the border and suddenly doing something that's going to get you in jail for 20 years. And this can create in itself some sense of disgust where people say there's an arbitrariness. The fact that you did this over here and not over there in the same country we feel uncomfortable about this. Maybe we should be repeating the laws federally. Yeah. I don't know if the, uh, trend towards drug legalization, it's, it's been marijuana legalization. I don't know if that had anything to do with jury nullification. I believe that sometimes drug cases result in hung juries because of the unpopularity of the drug laws. I'm not sure if that's caused pressure to change the laws, but the main thing that I think you should be thinking about. Like if you're a jury member or if you're a judge in a case, or if you're one of the lawyers, the main thing you should be thinking about is doing justice to that individual in that case. And this thing that I said about, so it sent, sent a signal that maybe the, maybe the politicians or maybe the prosecutors will change their practices. So I think that's true. And I intend that as like a response to an objection that somebody would say that somebody would say, Mike, you shouldn't go around saying this because, uh, it's going to cause whatever it's going to cause non-uniformity in our system. They go like, that's actually better having inconsistency where there are different outcomes in different cases where there was the same alleged crime. That's better than having it always give the unjust outcome. So are rights for you objective and is justice objective and would be universal? It would be the same in every place or if different societies have different moral codes and different intuitions about what is just and what is not, would justice be different? Should it be different in each of those societies? Yeah. So the facts about justice are objective, but they take into account the situation. So in some sense, the rules that appropriately apply could vary from one society to another because they could have different conditions. So what the social conventions are actually is a rel morally relevant factor, right? So it could be relevant because the social conventions in your society affect what it's reasonable for you to expect. And what's reasonable for you to expect affects what the just treatment of you, right? So if you made a transaction with someone and the, like the conventions of your society indicate that you have a certain right after making this transaction, although it wasn't stated in your agreement explicitly, then it's reasonable for you to think that you'd be treated according to those conventions and reasonable for the other person to think that too. And so it becomes just to act according to the conventions. The difficult cases arise when everyone seems to have the wrong view on something. So for example, let's say we rewind a hundred years and everyone thinks homosexuality is abominable and should be severely punished. How would your justice fare then? Because if you're relying on common codes, those common codes seem to give an unjust result, even though people believe that it's just. Yeah, we can think about this either at the individual level or the institutional level. So like the individual level question is what should you do? So let's say that you realize that your society has unjust norms and you're on the jury when Alan Turing is being put on trial for homosexuality, then you should vote to acquit <laughs> because you know that the law is unjust. So, but the institutional level question is. Yeah. How should we have our institutions work? So that's less likely to happen. Should we have the jury exercise their moral judgment or should we have them just follow the written law? It's not really clear because if your whole society is prejudiced, then the written law is going to reflect that prejudice. And also the judgments of the juries will reflect that. So it's not clear that you get an advantage, um, in that respect, but there are reasons why the jury tends to be better because um, they've seen that particular case. They know the details of that particular case. And like, they know the story of this specific defendant. So it's at least more likely that they make a correct judgment about that case than the sort of like blanket judgment made by the legislature. I think it's also, it's, it's easier to vote to violate people's rights in like a general election 
than it is to decide to violate somebody's rights who's sitting right in front of you when you get to see that person and hear their specific story. So one of the concerns that South African lawyers have about juries, I think there's something bizarre going on in that case, partly because I think we don't trust our fellow citizens to get to the right results. But part of it is that they might be just induced by the wrong reasons. So you can have a situation where the person who has suffered the wrong is just a very compelling storyteller. So you have a complainant who's able to narrate in an enormous amount of detail the horrible thing that happened to them, and you have an accused who's quite inarticulate. And so the compelling story leads to the accused getting a heavy sentence, even if maybe they didn't do it. And when you've got this sort of impartial judge who's really a professional juror in some senses, who's seen these kinds of cases hundreds and hundreds of times, who's steeped in the law, they've got the expertise to determine, is this best to tell the truth? Is this a, the correct proportion of punishment? It often strikes, I think, people who are in societies which don't have juries. One of the things that's odd, one is that juries get to determine guilt. The other one is damages awards. I mean, you can have a situation where a jury awards these very high damages because the particular story before them was very compelling. And they say, we want to punish this company. The famous case is the McDonald's hot coffee case, um, where the person was awarded $12 million. And it's not totally absurd. It's one of those things that often is used as a bit of a punchline to make fun of the American system. In some ways, what you had there was evidence of McDonald's refusing to ameliorate their practices and people getting quite badly scalded by this soup eated coffee. And the jury saying, well, this is going to be an instance where we're going to, we're going to whack them. And it's disproportionate based on this particular instance, but this is the instance before us and we want to make you pay. But it seems like you can have distortions in these sort of fact by fact situations. It's particularist, it's emotional, as opposed to the, the person who's sitting at a bit of a remove to decide what justice requires. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, like I would say the overall decision was correct, but the award amount was excessive and it was later reduced by a judge and then the parties, um, negotiated to make an out of court settlement. So I think we didn't get to find out the public didn't get to find out how much the ultimate award was, but yeah. So yeah, that's used as a, an example of the justice system going wrong, but it didn't really, right? <laughs> it like initially went wrong, but then it corrected. Okay. But part, part of the point you're raising here is wouldn't judges be more reliable than juries? And I think. Yes, basically. In most cases, judges are going to be more reliable and think like, why do we even have juries at all? And as far as I can tell, there's one reason why you would want juries. And that is in case the law itself is unjust. So in most cases that I think that doesn't come up, although drug cases, there's a lot of drug cases, but it's, it's still a minority. Uh, and in my view, all of the drug cases are cases of an unjust law, but yeah, in most cases, judges are going to be more reliable because there isn't an issue about whether the law itself is just or unjust. And the judges are going to, they're more experienced. Like they've seen a whole bunch of crimes and a whole bunch of criminals, and they've also seen the kinds of evidence. So like the judge is going to understand DNA evidence or whatever. If there are technical aspects, the judge is more likely to be able to understand it. And with his experience, he's more likely to judge what is or isn't plausible. So all the other stuff, apart from judging the morality of the law, all that other stuff, the judge said better. And there is a, there is a reasonable question about whether it's worth it to have a jury just for the cases where the law is unjust, that is our system. So one type of law that you feel is unjust in our present society, which would be repealed in your ideal society would be drug laws. So I think you mentioned that it, pretty much all drug laws today, you feel are unjust. Are there any other types of laws that you feel would, would be removed in this just society? Yeah, there'd be a lot fewer laws in the perfectly just society. It'd be, so a whole lot of economic regulations would not be there. There are other victimless crimes like uh, prostitution. So that would of course be legal. Yeah. About the economic regulations, like uh, the minimum wage law, we wouldn't have that. And like a bunch of these economic regulations, they're just sort of like, they're, they're, they would be contrary to the common law. So in the really ultimately just society, it would be anarcho-capitalist, but this is a long way off. And I didn't really talk about this in the book because I didn't want to get too radical and go to the things that are just too far away from, from what's feasible. Okay. But yeah, in the ultimately just society, it would all be common law because there wouldn't be a legislature. And so it would just be like two people come before a judge and they say, we have this dispute. I think this guy should pay me this money for this thing that he did. And the other person says, I don't think I should. And then somebody has to judge. And then you could reasonably predict there wouldn't be things like the judge saying, yeah, that, yeah, that's below the minimum wage that you should have. Cause where is he going to come up with this? 
So I wonder about a contemporary situation. You talked about it's important to protect rights in a, in a just society. And I think there's two different kinds of rights we can imagine. So uh, negative rights, in other words, I have a right for you not to infringe on my, my freedoms and my bodily integrity. And let's say positive rights, like you as the state have an obligation to give me things. All countries around the world have had lockdown rules imposed upon them. They've been told that you can't operate your business, you can't leave your house. And the reason we're doing this is because everyone has a right to access public health care, that if people intermingled freely, you would have explosions in COVID numbers, that there wouldn't be enough available hospital beds for people and people are going to die. And it's the right thing to do is introduce a law often overnight um, to curtail all these freedoms for in rights language to protect everyone's right to medical access or in utilitarian language to prevent suffering, to prevent deaths. Do you think that those laws are unjust and that there are people who are totally disobeying them? So there are people who've engaged in mass protests, who refuse to wear masks, who have operated their businesses unlawfully because they've said you're infringing on my rights and you have not got a just set of rules and we, uh, we feel the right thing to do is disobey them. Yeah. So that that justification that you described, I think is a bad justification. I think there is a better justification in line with libertarian thinking, which is appealing to the right to bodily integrity or something like, like that. Oh, you're going around without a mask and without getting the vaccine, then you're posing actually a physical danger to other people because there's a danger that you spread, you spread a disease to more people and then more people die. And right. Yeah. So in general. Like you can't kill people, but also it doesn't have to be hundred percent certain that the thing you're doing kills someone. So if you just cause an unreasonable risk, so some things like drunk driving, I think we would consider it to be rights violations. I think even libertarians would consider it to be rights violation, even though it's not even probable that you're going to harm anyone. It's just like, it's unreasonably risky. Okay. So then there's the question. I think this is a reasonable question to have. Is it unreasonably risky to go around without having been vaccinated or to just like go out in public and breathe on people. Uh, and that depends upon how bad the disease is and how easily transmitted it is. So I think there's a, there can be a reasonable disagreement about whether this particular disease is bad enough that you're violating somebody's rights by refusing to get vaccinated and still going out in public. Okay. By the way, like if you don't go out in public, then there's no issue. Then you're, you're not threatening anyone else. But in this particular case, like I wouldn't make these mandates partly because of the backlash. So one of the conditions for a law being just is it should have something to do with protecting people's rights. But another condition is it shouldn't cause more harm than good. <laughs> and I think actually the backlash against lockdown orders and things like that, also the, just the economic costs might be greater than the good that they do. So I wonder about a, a further case where we're dealing with, as you say, you, you've started to open up the, the room where we're not just talking about rights violations, but the risks of rights violations, rights will have as, as a strong sort of sense in it, um, something fundamental. I wonder about other kinds of harms. So some people will say, I have a right not to be subjected to offense. And Joel Feinberg's written on this quite well, and he talks about these different kinds of offense. So he has this chapter in his book, Offense to Others, where he talks about this bus ride. He says, imagine you're sitting on the bus and um, someone sidles up next to you and they've got this really revolting sandwich, which is made of um, organs and feces. And it's just really repugnant looking and smelling and they're eating. And while you're holding your nose, someone else joins the bus and they put on this ghetto blaster and they're just playing static, like really loudly. And the static happens to turn on this thruple who are behind you and they start copulating wildly and <laughs> screaming and burying their nipples. And so none of this sort of resulted in an actual harm, but it's all quite offensive. Is there a sort of can a state say we're going to regulate this behavior we're going to punish people for doing this offensive conduct even though it falls short of violating one's rights um, or causing them any actual financial harm or affecting their bodily integrity it's just unpleasant they the proper libertarian answer is no the state can't regulate those things but the proper libertarian way of dealing with this is that a property rights owner makes rules so like whoever owns the bus line now, unfortunately, the bus line is often owned by the state, which it shouldn't be. So wait, is that true? Or are they just, were they given a monopoly by the city or something? I don't know how it works. So anyway, if it's a private company, they should just make their rules and say, and they would probably make rules to prevent very offensive conduct because they want more customers to come on their bus. So they would be able to keep the person off. If the government actually owns the 
the land, which like, so they shouldn't, but they do it, but they do. Then what should they do? I guess the government should make the kinds of rules that would probably be made in the free market. I don't know, but I don't think the result of violating it should be that you go to jail or anything like that. I think you should just get kicked off the land, like just kicked off whatever public thing you're using, whatever public space. You're so I wonder about this move where the idea is that a private company can use its property however it wants. So you can imagine a restaurant in the sixties in Mississippi that says, we have a very strict right of admission reserved, no gays, no blacks, no Jews. It's our property. If you don't like it, go to another restaurant. But it turns out that everybody in the town has the same view and aren't very keen on those people coming to eat at the diner. Now, private rights, is there any sort of obligation on the state to require them to allow anyone else in? Are people doing something wrong if they violate the norms of that establishment? In other words, um, the black gay Jews go and sit down there and tuck in and refuse to leave? Let's see. So first question, does the state have an obligation to stop this? No. Let me point out that in the society where this would be happening, if the state got involved, they would get involved on the side of the prejudiced people. Because if the prejudice is that widespread, that there's not even like reasonable competition, like all of the restaurants are saying no blacks or whatever, then obviously the politicians who support that are going to win the election. Okay. But, and actually the free market is going to be better. So in the free market, if just like 30% of the people want to have blacks in their restaurants, it's fine. Like then there are, then there are going to be enough restaurants, but in the democratic system, if it's only 30%, sorry, you got outvoted. And then the voters can just impose this rule on everyone, including ones who don't, don't agree with it. So that's as a practical matter, but you know, anyway, as a moral matter, yeah, the state doesn't have to stop it because of property rights. Like if you're an asshole, like you just hate some people for no reason, you can still exclude them from your property. Now about the, would the protesters be doing something wrong? Intuitively, I feel like they're not doing anything wrong, but I think the, the property owner can still kick them out. So like the property owner is going to hire security guards or something to kick them out. And then, and then I would not punish the property owner. Now, the property owner is doing something wrong. <laughs> he's doing something wrong, but it's not a rights violation. Because, you know, what he's doing wrong is being an asshole or something like that, <laughs> like hating people for no reason, but it is still his property. So it's not a rights violation. I want to return to a few times you've used the word no, that you would know what the just thing is. So you mentioned the individual jurist, a uh, hundred years ago, gay rights case comes in front of him. All his fellow jurists say it's wrong. Homosexuality is wrong, needs to be punished. Uh, and this jurist. You said knows that it's not just to punish. Now in the Mississippi case, you've got everyone who's racist and homophobic and everyone around you saying it's wrong to have gay black Jews in your restaurants. You somehow know that it's okay to have them in your restaurant. But how do you know this? What is your epistemic access? Like, how do you know what is just? You can't trust the common law on this, right? Because the common law has gotten it wrong and you can't trust, trust your fair, fellow jurors and you can't do a poll because all of those are giving you a different answer to the one that you think is the right answer. So how do you know? Yeah. Like part of what you might be raising is that a person probably would not in fact know. So if, it, if you have a highly controversial view in your society at the time, it's plausible that you don't in fact know that you're correct. Because like you have the fact that almost everyone disagrees with you is evidence that you're not correct. And after you take that into account, maybe you don't have a high enough credence to count as, as knowing, but I don't think it's impossible to know that most of society is wrong. So how would you know? Yeah. So you think about it and you're going to see the wrongness and then you have, because most people disagree with you, you have to listen to what they say. The fact that other people disagree with you is evidence that you're wrong, but it's not conclusive evidence. So you have to listen to why they think what they do in order to find out if they have good reasons. But then let's say they start giving you their reasons and they're just like completely stupid. I think a good example today is, uh, you're thinking about the treatment of animals on factory farms, right? It's, it's just like obviously horrible, or it seems obviously horrible. And then you listen to what people say in defense of it. And they're just like completely ridiculous. They're just like obvious rationalizations. And so at some point you go, yeah, I know that's wrong. But then why are there those people? So in other words, they're going to say to you, we've thought about it too. And we've come to a different answer, a different conclusion. And we just, 
we feel it's obviously the case that your morality is too severe. You just, yeah. you're including these cases that just, they just don't seem to be necessary to include and animals suffer, but not as much as you think. And it just seems obvious to us that this is the case, right? So you've got you saying it's just self-evident. You just need to think about it enough and question your detractors. And, and they say exactly the same thing. And it seems like this is a problem for your view that's not faced by the traditional view, right? So on the traditional view, they're saying there's this legislature that, that has been voted in and through a democratic process, et cetera. And I understand all the problems with that. And that faces a whole host of problems that your view doesn't. But in at least this respect, it seems like the traditional view has an advantage over yours. It's not just two people who apparently self-evidently see opposite views. Wait, wait. Wait, I don't understand how the traditional view has an answer. Like, uh, how does the legislature know what's right or wrong? It's not that they know what's right or wrong, but it seems like there is a stance. And that stance has gone through a series of vetting processes which are not foolproof. And by the way, I actually support a position very much like yours. I, I, I really do, I really do sympathize with your position. It's just the worry I have is that things are far less self-evident than we think. So you can have cases of uncertainty, but that's just pointing out that it's not that common that you know that everyone else is wrong. That's, that's fairly rare. But look, as far as that goes, I just, I don't think that there's an alternative that solves this. Okay. So. I take it that you're saying, oh, but at least we know what the law says, even if we don't know what's morally right or wrong. So I point out first that actually we often don't know what the law says, like the law says something, but it's not clear what it means. And also, by the way, like some of the laws contain moral language. They contain like vague evaluative terms, like reasonable and unreasonable. And there's even in the constitution, there's a mention of just compensation and there's no guidance to what constitutes just compensation. So like the law actually incorporates these, you know, moral judgments. Okay. But anyway, but the thing is, so what if you know what the law is? That doesn't matter. <laughs> like what matter? It's like the story about the guy who's looking for his keys under the street lamp, even though he lost them in the dark alley. And he's like, okay, ask, why are you looking here? And he says, because the light is better here. Like the fact that, so it's easier to see under the street lamp, but so what? That's irrelevant if that's not where the keys are. So it's even if it's easy to know what the law says, that's irrelevant because our goal is to have the correct thing done, not the thing that, not a thing where we know that some predicate applies to it. It doesn't matter if some random predicate applies. Anyway, okay. Okay. And the, the hypothetical that you imagined was something like, oh, what if the other person says exactly the same thing that you say, or oh, it's just self-evident the other side thinks that their view is just self-evident and, and they just say exactly the same things that I say about them. That could happen, but in fact, it doesn't, right? Like you challenge the people about the factory farming, they try to give some justification. They don't just go, oh, it's self-evident, right? They try to give some reasons and then the reasons are lame. And then very frequently what happens is they just admit that it's wrong, but they're not going to do anything about it. Like I, it's very common actually to have people say, yeah, I know that it's wrong, but I'm just too weak willed. I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm just going to keep buying the meat products. So I'd like to play with two of the strongly hold values that you have. So on the one hand, I think you take the view that it's wrong to torture animals to death for people's personal pleasure, but also property rights are really important. So you can imagine the vegan activist who goes onto someone's factory farm and they destroy all of the killing equipment and they open up all the gates and they let the animals go free. Now you're going to say you've gone and violated someone's property rights. That wasn't your stuff. Um, you had no right to go and do that. They paid for that stuff, but you did it to vindicate other rights. Although I'm not so sure if you want to use the language of rights when it comes to animals, you might say other interests, or you generated some good by protecting these things from being uh, tortured to death. So do you want to have exceptions to certain rules? You want to say you can violate rights under certain circumstances? Yeah. Yeah, you can violate rights in certain circumstances. Yeah. Let's say that your next door neighbor is a serial killer and uh, you steal his gun, which he's been killing people with. And so, you know, that's a, it's a property rights violation. You stole it. It was his property. That's true, but that is justified, which is worse. Like somebody being deprived of their property or the thing the person is doing with the property that seems worse. Like in that case, like I would acquit the activists. I was on the jury. So let's assume that in other words, it's not just a matter of you being an individual juror who can rig the outcome of these particular facts, but in other words, the law becomes, if you destroy the property of anyone who runs a factory farm, there'll be no punishment. And so that just leads to widespread destruction. In other words, people go, you know, it's 
Some people are going to say, I'm doing this for the sake of the animal. Some people go, how much fun it is to go and like smash equipment at someone's place. And yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the cool exception. And, and maybe it's not just the, those guys, it's grocery stores as well. These guys are selling the meats. Let's go and smash up their stuff. Let's destroy the cash registers. Let's make the whole thing ungovernable. This mantle, this evil system of factory farming. And we can buy that as many property rights as you want, because Mike says there should be no sanction for us. We shouldn't be punished. Yes. <laughs> We're doing it for the greater good, man. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? So then, then factory farming would stop. Right. The world in which this would happen in the first place probably wouldn't have any factory farming, right? If there are that many people who agree with me, you know, they probably wouldn't be doing this. But say somehow the government gets taken over by vegan activists and then they pass a law that says there's no punishment for destroying factory farming equipment. Yeah. And then a bunch of that stuff gets destroyed and then the industry stops and then yay. You know, and then the world is much better off. Because do you know how much harm these things are causing? It's the amount of pain and suffering caused by the factory farms is comparable to all the human pain and suffering in all of human history. So then I sort of want to push in other directions where I think you'll get uncomfortable. So think about the enormous amount of suffering that's experienced by the poor. So one of the rules that was put in place, I think in California recently was to say, if you shoplift an item below a certain amount, you shouldn't be punished for it. You can say these are people who are poor, desperate, hungry, let them go and buy some property rights, but ultimately it's going to alleviate a lot of suffering. Are you going to be comfortable with not punishing those people who steal items under $500? I mean, this doesn't seem like a great rule of fault because it just seems like a whole bunch of people, it just seems like anybody's then going to just take anything. So I think if you're starving and you steal a loaf of bread because you're starving and you have no other way of getting the food, I think that is justified. But I don't think the state should make a rule saying anybody can do that. Anybody can steal bread at any time because then a bunch of non-starving people are going to do that. And it might be better to not have a rule, but to just leave it up to the judgment of individuals and individual cases. Okay. Now, in fact, I think like most of the people who would be stealing stuff are not, they don't actually need to do that. They're not so poor that they're going to starve if they don't steal stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If they were, then it is actually justified. But interestingly, I think the law shouldn't say that it should just be something that you as a jury member could decide in the individual case. It sounds like part of what you'd like in a system really would be less rulemaking and more virtue. In other words, people are wise enough to know this is a situation where you should exercise mercy. Uh, this is a situation where we ought not to bring down the hammer because of the particular facts. And maybe that's going to lead to some arbitrariness. You might get more compassionate outcomes overall. Yeah. I don't know why people are so concerned about uniformity, right? Yeah. So if we leave decisions up to individual discretion, the discretion of judges or jury members in the particular case, then there will be non-uniformity. There will be cases that appear similar or maybe cases that are relevantly similar and get different treatment. And I don't know why that's so bad. If it's closer to the correct treatment, like if it's so, sometimes they get treated fairly and sometimes unfairly, that's better than they always get treated unfairly. I, I don't know why we care about it being uniform. Maybe one reason why we want uniformity is prediction. So yeah. one, one criterion for justice is that people who are ruled by that justice should know ahead of time whether their actions are legal or illegal or would be punished or not in a justice yeah. system or in the system yeah. in which they reside. And if there's not uniformity, then they can't know. Yeah, that's right. And you might think in order to plan my actions, I have to be able to predict how the system is going to treat me. That's true, but not. So in the status quo, in fact, in a certain sense, you can't predict. Because actually most crimes, most of the time you break the law, you never get caught, right? If you look at the clearance rates for most crimes, they're way under 50%. So there's already this unpredictability. You don't know if the cops are going to catch up with you. You don't know what sentence you're going to get because actually in our system, like the prosecutors have a lot of discretion and there's like a lot of laws. So there's like a lot of things you could be charged with. And then they come up with this plea bargain agreement which is if you go to trial, you could get a sentence that's three times higher than if you take the plea bargain agreement, there's a lot of discretion for the prosecutor there. And then if you get convicted at a trial, then there's discretion on the part of the judge as to what sentence he's going to give you. Now, so does that mean that in actual fact, nobody can plan their actions in our society? Not really. So I think what you need is like 
You need to know that you're not going to be punished unless you violated the law. You don't need to know that you will be punished if you do violate it. So if you're running a business, you should know if you really want to be sure that you don't go to jail, don't sell cocaine at your business. Okay. If it turns out that actually it's not certain that you get punished for selling cocaine, like what if half the time you get acquitted? You like, it's hard to argue that means and now we can't plan our businesses because it's, it's already like only half, you know, less than half of the cocaine dealers get arrested anyway. It sounds like you're making an interesting sort of sororities line, which is, look, there's a whole bunch of ambiguity in the law. Why don't we just have the wise man who sits under the tree, the police grab you. If they get the vibe that you've done something a bit bad, they put you in front of them. the wise man goes, yeah, I've done some introspection. I've thought about it. I've applied my sort of moral principles and you go free. Or, nah, you're going punished. And people can comport their lives. They know generally what the wise man does. And we don't need to have these sort of tables of stashes that people can look in in advance. Like, it should be sufficient. But basically, those two things are sufficiently connected between each other that not so bad. Yeah. No, as I tried to suggest, I think it's important to know that you won't be punished unless you violate some laws where the laws could be identified in advance. So there should be some description. I don't think that the description of the laws has to be like perfectly precise. It should be that when you did something that was going to be punished, like you could have known <laughs> that there was a pretty good chance you'd be punished for this. It shouldn't just come out of the blue, but I it's not important that all law violations be punished, right? Like it's, it should be a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for being punished. And I think that's enough to make life predictable. About the wise man sitting under the tree, I think that the jury is better because you get 12 people, so it's less subject to idiosyncrasies, right, on the part of the one individual. And then, and yeah, but in general, they're probably going to have a pretty good judgment. And it's going to be better than the judgment of the average voter. And that's partly because the average voter just doesn't spend time on their voting decision. Like one of, one of the problems is the average voter knows that whatever I'm one in a million people in this election, or one in a hundred million, if it's a national election, they like, so they just don't care and they just don't pay any attention. They don't listen to the arguments. They haven't gathered any evidence, but if you have an actual trial, they have to sit there and listen. And then after that, like I, I have some confidence in like 12 ordinary people being able to make a reasonable judgment. Like you provided that they know what's going on. Well, Mike, I want to say thanks for joining us again. It's been a really fabulous discussion. I think we've managed to poke around some interesting areas in the philosophy of law and you're welcome back anytime. Great. Thanks. Great to be here.